Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. Are we living in a time of which there is more prophetic writings than of any period in history? Noah Parker, like many in the United States, has been asleep at the wheel. During his complacency, the founding precepts of America have been slowly, systematically destroyed by a conspiracy that dates back hundreds of years. The signs can no longer be ignored. Watch through the eyes of Noah Parker and his family as a global empire takes shape. Ancient writings are fulfilled and the last days fall upon the once great United States of America. The days of Noah, book one. Conspiracy by Mark Goodwin is a fast-paced fiction thriller which looks at how modern conspiracies could play into biblical prophecy concerning end times. Buy The Days of Noah in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition at Amazon.com today. Today's guest is Richard Duarte. He's the author of Surviving an Urban Disaster, and uh, he's just got a new book out, and it's the Quick Start Guide to Surviving an Ur- Urban Disaster. And this is a, it's a really a great book. It's very visually appealing, and and it's it's really boiled down and condensed, and it's just kind of got the uh, the great stuff for for somebody that's just stepping into prepping, or somebody that that needs to kind of review their preps and uh, and get back into. Uh, uh, the basics and and make sure that they're not getting over focused in one area. This book's perfect for that. Richard, welcome back to the show. Mark, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, uh, when when did this uh, book come out? Um, it just came out uh, uh, about a week ago, and and in fact, I'm, I'm a little frustrated because we've been having some trouble with uh, Amazon keeping it in stock. Uh, they keep uh, putting up that it's temporarily out of stock, and I called them and I gave them all kinds of grief. But they, you know, they assured me they have uh, orders coming in, and that um, the the book is actually available. There, there, it's just it's just that their inventory fluctuates. So as orders come in and uh, they're 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 filled, uh, you know, it, it just the system just shows out of stock. But that that shouldn't prevent anybody from placing an order. And this is one of those books that that people, you know, I sell a lot of my fiction books on on Kindle, but this is kind of one of those books that people want to have to hold it, and because it's one of those things that if you ever need it, you might not have electricity, you might not have a uh, a way of charging your your Kindle or your your iPad. Yeah, absolutely, and and the book is available on the Kindle, but uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Number one, I got to tell you. It, it's it's the most um, graphic and photograph intensive book I've ever I've ever done. Uh, it's got maybe 20, 30 photographs, full color co- photographs in there. So it's it's just a very it's just a very attractive book. Um, there's there's all kinds of references in there uh, in uh, in graphic format. So you know it's one of those books that I really recommend to folks that they get the actual paperback. Uh, to make it as easy as possible, because I know a lot of people love the Kindle, and I don't want to take that away from anybody. Uh, I've, I've actually got it set up on Amazon so that if you buy the paperback, you can get the Kindle for 99 cents. So, you know, it, it just it, it isn't any easier than that. Yeah, for another buck, why wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. And and if you were on the on the fence and you were thinking about getting the Kindle and you weren't sure about the paperback, I mean, the Kindle seven ninety nine. The paperback is thirteen dollars, so you know, in, in essence, you're you're getting really both for a little bit more than what you would have paid for the for the Kindle. And then, uh, and then, like we said, this is really boiled down. It's kind of really taken the essence of of uh, of prepping. And uh, you know, every time we get some news cycle like we've had with the Ebola, and every time there's a new natural disaster, every time we get a hurricane or a, or an earthquake or something like that, you get this whole new group of folks that. That, that see that that was just sort of the shot across the bow and they wake up and they say, you know what, 
I, I'm not prepared and I need to get prepared. And when you first get into it, it's it's overwhelming because there's so many things to focus on. And and if you start trying to uh, get into uh, getting your your communications license for, for shortwave or getting your ham license or something like that, and you start getting into all this really complex stuff, I mean, it will overwhelm you. You'll never get the time to get everything done. This book gives you like a really nice short list of things that you could go out. You could read this book, do everything in it, and uh, in two weeks or a month from now, you could be much, much more prepared than what you are now. And you could be relatively uh, well situated to, to face pretty much any disaster. Is that right? Yeah. And, you know, it's it's what I always say and what I always tell people when they ask me, um, I don't like to prepare for any specific uh, event or crisis. And as you noted, you know, who was expecting Ebola? Uh, no one was. And, and, you know, some people say, well, you know, I predicted it a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, if you predict enough things, some of them are bound to happen. But for, for, for all intents and purposes, you know, we really don't know, and no one really knows what, what's going to happen from one day to the next. So trying to guess the future and, and to predict what's going to happen, that, that's a losing battle, and it always will be. Um, what, I tell, what, what I tell people all the time, and, and this is something that I discovered a long time ago, is that if you stick with the basics, you just cannot go wrong. And for me, the basics are the food, the water, the first aid, the sanitation and hygiene, the knowing when to stay put, when to get out. Uh, you know, the, the, the simple everyday things that you just absolutely need to survive for any extended period of time. And if you account for those basics in your plan, no matter what occurs, you're going to have a much better chance than if you try to anticipate what may or may not happen, and then try to plan for those specific events. I'll give you an example. Down here in, in Miami, where, where we're located, um, you know, the most likely event that's going to affect us year in and year out is a hurricane. And, yeah, a lot of people prepare for a hurricane. And if you, you were to tell me, listen, I'm either going to prepare for a hurricane or I'm not going to prepare at all, I'm going to tell you prepare for a hurricane. But, the, the, you know, we also have a lot of other risks that, even though they're a lot less likely, they could occur. And if all you're doing is focusing your attention and, 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 and all your efforts towards one specific event and then something else happens, now you've got to make a major adjustment. And it's true that some of the preparations do overlap, but why limit yourself? You know, the whole idea behind getting prepared is to give yourself as many options as possible. So what I've really tried to do with this guide is to make it as clear as possible that it's the survival essentials that will get you through. And if you focus on those basics, no matter who you are and where you live and what the perceived risks may be, if you focus on those basics, you're going to give yourself a, a much better chance to survive any crisis than if you try to go off in another direction. And, uh, you know, one more thing. This is as simple as it, as it gets. Uh, a lot of people make this complicated, and it doesn't have to be. The, 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 basic, the basics are really simple. Um, what you really have to do is you have to focus on the things that matter. And a lot of people make their preparations very complicated, which I never recommend, uh, because they start getting into things that uh, they think are going to make their preps better. Uh, but more complicated isn't better. More complicated is just giving yourself more opportunities for things to go wrong. And you go into detail in the in the book about what the urban survival basics are, and also as you call them the core survival elements. Can you can you list the core survival elements for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, food, water, uh, personal security and self defense, first aid and medical, uh, sanitation and hygiene, and then knowing when to stay put and when to get out. What we did in this particular quick start guide is. We devoted a chapter to each one of those. And in the chapter, we very specifically start out with what you need to know, what you need to do, and what you need to get. So in other words, under each one of those categories, there are bullet points that tell you, okay, what do you need to know? Under food, you know, there are certain things we need to know. For example, um, a man-made or natural disaster can potentially disrupt the supply chain very, very quickly. And even though they tell us, well, there's about 72 hours worth of inventory on the shelves, you know, those 72 hours are, are, are really, uh, 
you know, it's, it's misrepresenting the situation. The minute there's any kind of a crisis, like, for example, they announce a hurricane in the Atlantic, you know, the shelves empty out within hours. And I've seen it over and over again. And it's because everybody waits till the last minute and then there's all kinds of panic buying. So if you expect to be able to go to the supermarket on day two and, and still get your supplies, you know, day one, they're gone. So these are things that you have to know and you have to plan for in advance because if you have bad information and, 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 and if you expect something that's unrealistic, it, it's just not going to work. Um, so under each one of those categories, we go into the specifics. We go into the really the bare minimum of what you need to know in order to be able to get prepared. Because remember, a uh, quick start guide has to be quick. And it has to be easy, it has to be understandable, and it has to be formatted in such a way where people really don't have to put a lot of effort into getting the information that they need. And and that was the, the overwhelming number one priority, to make it as easy as possible. And that's also the reason for a lot of the pictures. You know, people tell me, oh, they look wonderful. These pictures are great. They're very attractive. That wasn't the idea. The idea was to give people a visual so that the what they're going to read – comes and it becomes understandable a whole lot easier. I, for example, I'm a visual learner. So if I see a picture, that you know speaks volumes to me. If I have to sit there and read three or four paragraphs, then you know I have to piece it together and mentally create a picture. Whereas if the picture's there, you can just go to it and say, oh, so that's what a, a fully stocked pantry looks like. That's what a first aid kit should you know, should contain. And even though I list out all the supplies in the actual chapter, I also provide a very detailed picture so that they can look at it and say, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. And now they go in and they, and they, and when they read it, it makes a whole lot more sense. I think that's a perfect example. I'm very visual too. And to, to somebody to give me a, it like, and I'll give an example. Um, if, if I'm going to go somewhere and somebody gives me verbal directions you know you take a left at uh 14th street and go two miles and then hang a right on uh, at the second light you know that just kind of doesn't make sense to me but if you give me a map and i can i can look at how the road goes and i can just sort of visualize in my mind where i need to make turns and how far it's going to be and and i think that that's what you've done with these pictures in here is you can you can sort of look at that that stockpile and say okay i'd like to sort of replicate that i kind of get an idea of of what i'm shooting for or in the water section, you know, uh, somebody that's never seen like the bathtub buddy, you know, they can kind of see what that or the water bob, I think, is the uh, another uh, uh, product is similar. And uh, and they can see kind of what a water bob looks like and they can sort of see what the, the filters look like and what a life straw looks like. So if they're in the camping store looking for that kind of stuff, they kind of know what they're looking for now. Or if they're on Amazon scrolling around and trying to find those 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 items or those products, uh, they they kind of get an idea of uh, what it should look like when they find it. And, yeah, and I think that's that's a that's a great idea. Yeah. And uh, and then then there's the firearms pictures, and that's just that's just a beautiful picture. That's something <laughs> I can that's something I can hang on my wall right there. <laughs> Uh, I, I think you hit it right on the head, especially with that analogy with the directions, because I'll stop and I'll ask somebody for directions and I have to tell, no, please just slow down and tell me slowly because I can't, <laughs> unless I write it down, I just can't remember all those steps. So, you know, you, you've hit it right on the head. That's exactly the reason. Now for the person that's just waking up and, and, uh, and they're, uh, they are a little overwhelmed and they're listening to this show right now, where do they start for food? What's a good way to like really boost that and, and kind of kick that kickstart that? Well, you know, the beauty of this is that you don't need to do any sort of level of preparation. Um, you just have to get started. And the, the, the advice I give people all the time on getting started, because they'll ask me, Richard, you know, what's the easiest way to get started? What can I do? I, I'm on a limited budget. I don't know a lot about what I need to buy or, you know, how much or how I, how, how, how to store it or any of that stuff. You know, I tell them, listen, the easiest way to get started is just every week when you go to the supermarket, just buy a little bit extra of the things that you normally buy. And if you were going to buy two cans of sweet corn, try to buy four or five and set up, set up a little pantry for yourself, or a little shelf, you know, whatever space you have available that's, um, you know, at a constant 
temperature that's kind of cool, that's away from direct sunlight, that you're not going to have problem with humidity or pest, and, and try to set up a little area where you can get organized and you're going to use those two cans that you bought for your, for your normal consumption, but then you're going to put the other three cans away. And the following week, you go in and you do the exact same thing, maybe with a different product. And now you start putting away the extras, using the most, the most, the oldest first, really, and putting away the most recent, and then rotating the supply that you have. And I tell folks, you'd be surprised after six months of doing that, you'd be surprised just how much food you've accumulated and how much of an inventory you've built up for yourself that you didn't have six months before. So you didn't have to go out and spend hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars. You didn't drive yourself crazy by ordering all kinds of food that now you have to organize and uh, categorize and rotate. You know, you're doing it little by little. You're building it up. And when you have a few extra bucks, by all means, go out and buy a little bit more. Uh, there, there are all kinds of options available nowadays. And, and I strongly encourage people to explore those options because everybody's situation is different. And, um, for example, most of the food that you're going to use on an ongoing basis is not going to be long-term storage-type food. It's, it's going to be food that you can store probably for the short to medium term. But for the really long term, you know, you're going to want to look into uh, white rice, dry beans. You're going to look into some of the dehydrated products. And that requires a little bit more information and a little bit more uh, research. But again, we've addressed all those things here and we've laid out all those options so that you can choose where you want to start, how much you want to spend, how much time you want to devote to this, and you know what your family's needs are. Um, in, in the section for the food, uh, for what you need to get, we list at least 30, 35 food products that we recommend uh, that are all calorie dense. They're all, they, they all store very well. They require very little, if any, preparation. And most of them are just really open and eat because in many situations where there may be um, the need for this type of, of, of food, uh, you're also probably not going to have power or sometimes you're not going to want to uh, do any kind of cooking uh, because of whatever the circumstances may be, you may not be able to. Uh, so you, you, you know, the, the the name of the game in survival is is calories, and and you just want to be able to get enough calories inside of you to be able to survive and to stay alert and to stay strong and to stay physically well. Uh, and and these foods will do that for you. And, and, and you really hit that on the the head, uh, saying that you you just kind of build on on the preps that you have and you just kind of keep doing it little by little from the beginning my goal has always been to be a little more prepared today than i was yesterday and i think with that sort of a prepping philosophy you know it's never been really uh, this this crazy thing like you said where you've got to go out and spend uh you know thousands of dollars and then come home and try to organize all this stuff um and I think it's a little bit, it's sort of like a diet. You know, you hear a lot of folks going on diets and they'll try to, you know, lose 20 pounds in a week or something like that. And then they put it all back on. And, and that's, you know, doctors always tell us that's not the way to do it. What you do is you change your lifestyle and, and you start, uh, you, you know, just uh, thinking of it as a, as a budget with calories and you want to spend more than you're, uh, spend more than you're you're making in. It's like the opposite of of a financial budget. You want to you want to get rid of more calories than you're bringing in, and 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 uh, you you adjust your lifestyle to that. And I think that while maybe prepping, you may have sort of this ramp up period at the beginning, and then you can kind of like sort of scale it down to a sort of a maintenance program. Uh, I, I think that it's very very similar in, in that way of of just making it a lifestyle. And and that keeps it from being really a, a stressful ordeal, and you never have a, a huge uh, money dump all at one time, and uh, and you never have a whole bunch of stuff to try to sort out and figure out where you're going to put it. Yeah, and I'm and I'm glad you mentioned that uh, because it is a lifestyle, and and I and I mentioned that in the book. It's not something you can do over a long weekend and then forget about. Uh, which a lot of people say, well, you know, I'll, I'll work on it real hard. I'll, I'll get it all in place. And then, you know, I don't have to think about it. Well, it doesn't work that way because for, for a bunch of reasons. But, you know, number one is, um, and we're kind of forgetting this sometimes, but 
preparedness is more about knowledge and skills than it is about stuff. If you have the knowledge and the skills, you can always figure out a way to make everything work uh, to your benefit. If you have a lot of stuff, then all your emphasis has been put on the material things that you have. And if those things are lost or somehow compromised or, you know, there's any kind of an issue where those things are not accessible to you, now you got a huge problem. It's time for a quick break, and we'll be right back. The dollar's lost over 90% of its purchasing power since 1971. Silver, on the other hand, has proved to be a very stable form of wealth preservation over the years. And where do you buy silver? Silver.com, of course. Silver.com offers fantastic prices on silver and gold. Check out Silver.com today. You've got a section in the book, and it's called Knowing When to Stay Put and When to Get Out. Is that something that folks need to to plan ahead of time because if you don't is there a risk that uh, you know you were talking about panic buying earlier and is that something that you is that a decision that you could make in a in a panic and maybe because of the panic it could cause you to make the wrong decision so is that something you need to think about beforehand yeah it, it definitely is and that's one of the reasons why um in in the first book i devoted an entire chapter to all three things um knowing when to get out when to stay put uh, the, you know having the right equipment in this particular guide, I've broken it down uh, each into one chapter for each. Uh, for, for example, number seven, chapter seven is getting out fast, uh, bugging out. Uh, chapter eight is sheltering in place, bugging in. And chapter nine is getting home, uh, or what I call bugging back. And, and I think you have to plan for all three of those circumstances. And, you know, you'll hear people say things like, well, I don't believe in bugging out. Bugging out is very dangerous, and you just don't know what you're going to face when you hit the road. And, and, you know, there's all kinds of circumstances that could take you down. And I agree with that. I agree that bugging out is extremely dangerous and should only be done as a last resort. But guess what? What if you're forced to bug out because you have no other option? So now you've dismissed this as a possibility, but yet it comes your way and you're, and you're forced to do it. What do you do then? So I, I, you know, my recommendation is always since you're not preparing for any particular event or any set of circumstances, you're preparing for everything by addressing these basics. Uh, I have a bug out bag. In fact, we all have a bug out bag in our family. And if something should happen that forces us to leave, we're ready and we have not only the bug out bag, but we have various bug out plans because we may plan on taking I-95 and driving straight up. But guess what? What if I-95 is not available to us? Now we have to have a different path and we have to have a plan for getting fuel and, and maybe additional water or supplies along route. Um, if we just had one plan and that one plan goes out the window, now we have nothing. So, um, and people say, well, what would force you to bug out if you don't believe in bugging out? Well, what if, for example, you know, uh, my house burns down and in that moment I need to get out within seconds and I need to grab one thing and leave. What am I going to grab? I want to grab my bug out bag because in my bug out bag, I have everything I need to survive for a minimum of three days. Plus, I have copies of all my important legal and financial papers either a, a physical hard copy or on a flash drive or a hard drive. And if I have to leave very, very quickly, I've got copies of all the documents and all the licenses and, and all the credit cards and all the insurance companies and all the things, all the banking information, everything I need. If, for example, I have to leave in a very big hurry, let's say it's a very local emergency or crisis. There's a problem in my, my neighborhood and, and a few of the houses get, you know, uh, affected by a fire or an explosion or something like that. I need to be able to get out very, very quickly. That's part of my plan. So, um, if, if, if something else happens and the, the, the option is not to bug out, but to stay put, then I also have to have supplies and a plan for that. And I can't start thinking about it and, and, and really do it on the fly when things occur because at that point it's way too late. So you need to have the plans in place. You need to have the supplies in place and expect absolutely nothing. Don't expect that things are going to happen a certain way and don't expect that anybody's going to be there to help you. In other words, expect absolutely nothing. 
that people run into trouble when they expect things, when they expect a certain disaster to play out in a certain way, when they expect certain governmental and other agencies to be around to help them when, when things go badly. Um, there was a report not too long ago in the news about um, one of the one of the agencies that helps out when there are disasters. And um, it was horrible. I mean, reading it, you, you just, you became horrified. Um, they, they, during the last few hurric- big, really big hurricanes, there were reports that they sent out trucks that were completely empty uh, just to do photo ops and just to do PR. But they weren't in a position to help anybody. But yet when people took and when reporters took pictures, they saw the truck there, you know, and, and this is it, 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 and this is what we, you know, as a society are putting our, 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 our reliance on that. These folks are going to be there to help us when when something goes wrong. So, you know, one of the message one of the messages is always listen, expect nothing. And the only source of relief or self rescue is yourself and your group, whoever you've, whoever you have in your group that, that might be able to lend you a hand and that's it. And, and that's how you have to plan it. And, and bugging out is, that's a, it's, that's great. You have to have a plan and expect nothing. I think that you really, really hit the nail on the head with that comment. Uh, we recently went to uh, Tennessee to just to basically go up there and sort of see the, the pretty colors and the leaves. And we were going to go to a, uh, a bluegrass festival and when we got to the hotel that we'd booked, it was it was filthy. I mean, there were there were bugs on the scene, and this wasn't a cheap hotel. It was a red roof inn. Uh, we paid. A, I'm going to go ahead and put them out there because <laughs> it, it, this is something that you know. This is good information for people when they're when they're going to be traveling of places to stay away from. But uh, it was it was 109 dollars a night plus tax. It came up to like 130 bucks a night. So this wasn't like a, some sleazy. Uh, w- when you look at it online, you don't think that it's going to be some sleazy hotel. But we get there. There's bugs on the wall. There's stains on the sheets. There's stains on the the bedspread. I mean, it was it was not something where we could stay at all. So we had to leave, and uh, we're driving around trying to find another hotel. They were all booked, and this is just from the the leaves changing colors. So yes. you can imagine if you have to bug out because there's a chemical spill, or you have to bug out because there's a, a dirty nuke set off uh, in your in your vicinity, or even for us. Uh, you know, we have to bug out for hurricanes, you know, and and you think that you're just going to re- drive up the road a ways and get a hotel. Well, there might not be any hotels because this was just this was just because and this wasn't peak season. This was at the beginning of the of the, the fall uh, leaf season for them. And and uh, they were completely booked up. So uh, that's probably not something you're going to have. So it's something you have to think about. You know, are, do you have a sleeping bag? Do you have a tent? Do you have, uh, you know, uh, a, a way to. And that's not the the most secure form of uh, of shelter, especially in a in a sort of a grid down type scenario. Do you have a way of defending yourself, and do you have a, a sort of a watch plan for somebody to stay up and 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 keep watch while the other person sleeps? And and that's all stuff to think about. And then another thing, while we're on uh, the, the the topic of of being down here in Hurricane uh, the Hurricane Alley. Uh, we see it all the time, complacency. And, and you said you said earlier, you said prepping's not something that you do today and then you just forget about it. Uh, it's something that you have to, to go back over and review your preps and, you know, are these batteries still good? And did I use up all of the green beans? Do I need to restock that? And, and here, uh, after we have a big hurricane, the following two or three years, people will, are very, very vigilant about that. But when it's been five or six years since we've had a big storm, people will start to get complacent. And they'll start to get lulled back to sleep, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the big change, I think, in the last hundred years has been uh, a big, a huge shift from self-reliance to reliance on third parties to provide the things that we need. In other words, most people nowadays are of the mindset that, you know, my, my, my biggest obligation is to go to work and make enough money so that I can pay for all the things that I need. Um, and, and that's the way really most people live uh, uh, in cities and, and sometimes outside of cities, big cities. But in reality, many of us have become so reliant on on that particular way of doing things that we just cannot imagine anything else. 
Uh, when was the last time you heard somebody walk into a house that they were thinking about buying or renting and asking the realtor, is there running water? Uh, is, is there a sewer system with this house? Uh, is, are there garbage? Do they have garbage pickup? Um, you know, if we need to call the police, uh, you know, do they have police service or, you know, fire rescue service in this area? Those are all things we take for granted. We don't ask. We ask, is there a fireplace? You know, when was the last time the roof was changed? Uh, how new is the kitchen? Uh, we, we just don't think about any of those things at all because we take them for granted. We just expect them to be there. And uh, along with that, we expect food. On, on, uh, on the supermarket shelves. We, we expect, you know, a police officer to be at our beck and call when we call 911 or, or the fire rescue folks. And th these are all the things that instead of having the assumption that they're all going to be there for you at your convenience, you really have to assume that they're not going to be there and build from there. And when you build your plan, how many times have you gone on a vacation? And you imagine you've never been to this particular location or this destination, but you imagine how things will be. And when you get there, nothing works the way you imagined. Nothing looks the way you imagined. Nothing uh, unfolds the way you imagined that it would. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's worse. Sometimes it's just different. But the point I'm trying to make is you could never, if you if you haven't lived through a particular situation, you could never really envision all the different aspects of it um, until you're there. So if you try or if you assume that there are certain things that are going to be there for you and certain uh, things that are going to benefit you, you know, you're, you're really playing with fire. Uh, if you assume that during a disaster you're going to have running water, you're really taking a dangerous, a very dangerous situation, and you're making it even more dangerous by adding additional risk because there may not be any water. And if all of a sudden, for example, like what happened in West Virginia a few months back where the water supply became contaminated and from one moment to the next, they just told entire towns, don't drink the water, don't use it to bathe, don't use it to cook, don't use it to even wash your hands because it's contaminated. And all of a sudden you had thousands of people, maybe even hundreds of thousands in a panic because they had no water. Days, all those folks had assumed that they didn't have to store any water because water would always be available at their tap. And along with that assumption, many other assumptions. And if I can't get it from the tap, I'll just run to the store and buy a few cases. Uh, but what if all those assumptions that you, you, you held on to were wrong? And those folks in West Virginia were actually, they went to the store and they were fighting over bottled water. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's and it was a very localized thing. So you know, it was it, for any of those folks in that that area, you know, they were less than a tank of gas away from going somewhere where they could get clean water, and yep. they were still fighting over it. And they were still fighting over so it. What do you do with when it's a larger scale right. uh, disaster? But at that moment, there's so much confusion and there's so much misinformation that a lot of these folks may not have known. Uh, how far outside their area they were, they were going to have to travel in order to get water. And, you know, the immediate reaction is just the panic. Um, you know, I always say that the prepper, whether you, and you can be a prepper without even knowing it. The, the prepper is the person who keeps their tank, um, their gas tank on their vehicle, uh, never lets it go below three quarters. The moment they see it going lower, they pull over and they fill up. The non prepper, is the person that waits till the, the needle is below E. And then they start thinking about when they're going to stop to get some gas because they're, they're operating under the assumption that just around the bend, just down the block, there's going to be a gas station and they're going to be able to get their gas. And, you know, the, 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 the realization really comes when they get to that gas station and they're told, hey, well, we don't have any gas. <laughs> but they don't expect that. And, and they're like, no, how could that ever happen? Of course there's going to be gas. So, you know, that, that's really the difference if, if you want to if you want to use an analogy that everybody can relate to. Sure. sure. So a lot of great information, Richard. Uh, thanks so much for taking time to come on the show. Now, the book uh, is available on Amazon. We're going to have links to it in today's show notes so people will be able to go straight over to Amazon and purchase it. But now you have a, uh, a Facebook page, uh, Twitter and uh, also a website for the book, right? Can you tell yeah. us about those? That's correct. Um the, the, the Facebook, we post a lot of good information on it uh, daily, on a daily basis. And, you know, we encourage people to, to go there 
And it, it's actually Facebook, uh, Surviving Doomsday, the book. Um, and you know, you'll, you'll post the links to that. And, and if people want to stay on top of the latest news, the, nat- the latest survival tips, uh, all the good information that people should really stay on top of, you know, we're posting stuff almost daily and, and sometimes even multiple times a day. And the, uh, the, the website is uh, survivingdoomsdaythebook.com. And we're also posting on there all the time. Um, we encourage folks to stay on top of a lot of these things and to do the very best that they can within their ability. Not everybody's going to be able to maintain six months' worth of food and water and supplies. But if, if all you could do is build it up little by little and, and maybe start with two weeks and build it up to a month, um, expand beyond that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a good place to be. Because if you have a month's worth of food and water and supplies, you are so much better off than if you had done absolutely nothing and and you were like most people where you had maybe three days worth of food in your pantry, if that. And some people don't even have enough water for three days. They they have maybe a day's worth of water. Um, oh, we also have a section in the book about emergency, now that I, that I remember, emergency water supplies. In other words, where to find water when all your other supplies have dried up and um, you, the, the, the tap just isn't available. You know, what are the other sources of, of, of water that are within your reach? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the book will be available in Spanish um, towards the end of the year. Uh, we have a huge Hispanic population here in, in South Florida. And in fact, you know, there's many places around the world that, that, that people, uh, you know, there's preppers everywhere, Mark. I, I'm amazed. You know, we travel a lot. And, you know, there are preppers in Europe. There are preppers in South America. There are preppers everywhere. Uh, we we get folks writing to us from Australia, from South Africa, uh, I mean, everywhere. And we want to make this available to as many people as possible. So we're going to start, We you know, obviously we started with the English. We're going to go to the Spanish. And if, 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 um, if the demand is there, we'll even translate to other languages. And then Surviving Doomsday, that was your first book. And that is just a little bit more comprehensive book, right? So uh, for for the more advanced prepper, if they're looking for something that, uh, you know, they've kind of already got the basics down and they're looking for something to uh, get a little bit more in-depth, that's a good book for them. Is that right? Yeah. That, you know, it's actually an old school book because you have to read. <laughs> there are no pictures. It's just um, a lot of background information. We go into a lot of the why and we go into a lot of the uh, history and, you know, how we got to where we are and, you know, this over-dependence that most people exhibit, you know, how, how it came to be and, and why it's so dangerous. So there's a lot of background information that a lot of people want. They, they want to read about that and they want to understand the process. The quick start guide is just for the folks who say, listen, just give me the facts, just the facts, ma'am. I just need to know exactly what I need to do, how I need to do it, and how I can get started really, really quickly. Um, you know, they, they both have a place, but uh, like you said, they're different. And, and Christmas is right around the corner, and you got to get everybody something anyway. And you know, rather than giving them a, a tie that's going to go straight in the garbage the second you leave the house, why not get them surviving an urban disaster? Uh, the quick start guide because that's something that's that's going to be helpful. And whether they need know they need it or not, uh, you know, it's a, and it's a great stocking stuffer for, for those that are sort of on the edge and maybe just starting to to wake up to the need to be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, on, on a selfish note, um, if you give this book to somebody and you're able to get them to prepare even just a little bit, those would be fewer people going to your house. Because once they know that you're prepared, all these people have got it in their minds that they're going to go to the house of the people that they know have all these preparations made. So, you know, one of the things that I really, really try to do all the time is tell my relatives, listen, you know, I love you all, but I can only take care of so many people. And, you know, my plans don't really allow me to take care of uh, three dozen, four dozen people that I wasn't planning for. So you guys need to do your own preparations and you need to make your own, um, you know, plans. And this is something that you could give to somebody who has no experience whatsoever and has never done any prepping. And they could get going and get started and, and put a serious dent in their preps within a few days. And that was the whole idea. Absolutely. Richard, thanks again for coming on the show, and uh, thanks for all the great information. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. 
When a dark plan forged by the world's elite brings disaster to the nation, two unlikely friends must rely upon each other for survival. Will they live long enough to expose the powers that be? Find out in the new novel, The Chaos Agenda, by Seth Evanoff. They have a plan for the future. Refuse to follow it. The Chaos Agenda. Available in Kindle and print on Amazon.com.